controversial subjects with the facts can be tense. But we are a sub science here to make things make sense. Today, we're talking about Tiger King, the Netflix documentary. We're going to use science and conservation to explain why it might not have been the best documentary. And we're also going to look at the ancient history of cats. Let's jump into it. Cats the musical? Yeah, no, we're not doing that again. <laughs> the ancient history of that eight like, 80s. You know, where, you know, I was always obsessed with like Egyptian uh, worship of cats and dogs. And so I did a little Wasn't everyone in, didn't everyone go through their grade seven Egyptian phase? Yeah, because it's so fascinating. <laughs> it's such an interesting cultural reference point. Or the mummy came out and we were all just oh, like, true. scarab beetles. <laughs> um, how's it going? We didn't say the, hi, I'm Mitch. Oh, Whoops. hi, I'm Mitch. And actually, I might have just confused you because I said, I'm Mitch. I'm actually not <laughs> Mitch. I'm Greg. <laughs> and welcome back to Side Note. Um, going on over a month of quarantine for us. Day 32 of Core Core. Um, These gray say, walls are a malaise of... If you listen to the audio only yes. version of this podcast, you heard one last week. We didn't post one on YouTube because it was done months ago with Grace Halbig. So if you're a YouTube watcher, go listen to it. Audio Which was only. actually very interesting. I feel like there was a pep in our step in our voice. It was like, <laughs> wow, we certainly like the pandemic was looming. We definitely talked about it a lot, but yeah, it was we knew not where it was it. now. I just us. watched a really funny YouTube sketch that was this girl saying my uh, telling my what was the name? It was like telling my previous self previous self about the pandemic like explaining it so it's like a girl from <laughs> four smart. months from now looking talking to herself four months ago like little jokes like her being like oh my god yeah like the australian fires are definitely going on right now it's going to definitely define this year and, and she's like oh what the what you know like it's like that felt like such a big deal but now we're all like wait that's, that's definitely but not that's a, also really sad we can't stop thinking about climate change no but it's like that's definitely not gonna define this year. oh my god and the war with iran yeah quotes, there was a time like, when oh those god. were like tw the 2020 issues and now yeah everyone's meme was like a them. war and wildfires like could this year get any worse and it's like <laughs> i know like we need to stop saying that because it's like can this year get any worse no what this year is this year is that noise from inception that's like burn <laughs> <laughs> it's like this is all Christopher Nolan's fault and Hans Zimmer. Uh, well, okay, nerd alert. <laughs> well, Hans Zimmer like invented that. No, he didn't invent it, but he definitely popularized that. And then every movie and every trailer started using that. What the? Yeah, yeah, the it became horn. such a trend. I wish that I like had that on like my phone. I could play it in public more often. Like if someone was like arguing like on the subway and just be like, oh my, oh my god, remember subways? <laughs> oh. uh, no, people still have to use the subway. Just we are privileged and we don't. We just have to yeah. live and work at home and go on our podcast. Like life's hard. I imagine men, many people aren't using the subway now though. Like it must be much more empty than normal. Yeah, hot right. take. Because that is like your, like your time. No, you're like, well, people are still using it. It's like, they no, are. People still have to use it. It's an essential. I service. just mean like many are not. It's definitely not as busy. Um, but you're doing okay. Um, like, we yeah. got a lot of responses about definitely doing an episode on mental health, especially well, which, with relation to quarantine and self isolation, which we are working on. We're working mm -hmm. on an episode right now called "Your Brain on Quarantine," and, and it's we'll hopefully very... do a podcast about it as well. It's very, <laughs> that was good. That was, I feel like we're like media trained. I was like, you're like, and we're also doing a podcast on that as well. Actually, we like literally are. I went, went to YouTube and they taught me how to like talk to the media. It was weird. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's not that much research on this uh, type of quarantine. And a lot of it is from Hong Kong and from all these studies of people who have self-isolated or gone into quarantine who are like healthcare workers who are directly interacting with SARS. Mm -hmm. Like, the mass amounts of people right now in physical isolation is, Agreed. I'm going to say one of the most important words of our uh, year. Uh, it's unprecedented. <laughs> uh, well, should we just jump into our episode? Yeah. Cause I feel like usually we have things to talk about what we did this week. And literally it's like the same. It's clean. Everything is the same. Nothing has changed. <laughs> okay. But let's just think of like, okay, let's think of, each one tangible thing we actually did. Okay. okay. I feel like we just kind of go, oh. I know I have one actually. I'm okay. really good. You can go first. You no, me? no, I want you to go first. Uh, I, I don't think I said this on the podcast yet, but I'm taking an online course in the science of well being. And I really like it. It's That's, like basically about the science of happiness. And it's a free course from Yale. And I'm really enjoying it. I don't know if it's too late to join. Probably. So you're remember. like literally going to Yale right now or something? <laughs> I'm actually a Yale student and soon to be a Yale graduate from my one course. <laughs> Did you pay the money so you got the certificate or no? No. 
Okay, well then you're not a graduate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh my yeah. God. <laughs> anyway, it's a really interesting, fascinating course, uh, and I've learned a lot. Of, I'm only in like the third week. So. Every day I'm like I'm sad, and Mitch is like, "Well, I'm not because I'm in the sanctuary." <laughs> well, the only thing about it is that the <laughs> professor you. starts the course by being like, "You'd think as a professor of science and well-being, I'd be happy." But that's not how it works. <laughs> Basically, and I was like, oh, wait, what? I don't know. If I, I know everyone this. who tries to teach happiness <laughs> is like the number one rule is there's no such thing. Yeah. Honestly. Which is true. We just have to balance our binaries and try and be more in the middle. But right. is the middle gray? Okay, wait, what? what is it, my turn? What's <laughs> easier turn? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unlike happiness, I learned how to blanch spinach really well. Oh, you did. I that really did. Great. So I've been learning how to cook Korean food from like this amazing woman on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Very low views. I'm gonna I'm gonna show I'm gonna like give her some likes from the ASAP Science channel and boost her like <laughs> algo algorithm. <laughs> but it's like I'm just gonna explain it to you right now because it's amazing. You take the spinach, you put it into boiling water. Uh, uh, so many people who cook are gonna be like, yeah, duh. <laughs> you put the spinach into boiling water for 30 seconds only, and then you scoop it out with like um a sifter, strainer thing, put it <laughs> right into is that a word? You put it right into ice cold water. Take it out and then you put it into like a little snowball in your hand. Chop it up. Soy sauce, sesame oil, sesame seeds. Bam. It was really Delicious. good. Delicious. Nutritious. Greg's been cooking Korean food for me for weeks now. Yeah, I'm a little housewife. It's amazing. Um, and we're lucky that the store that's near us has like so much Korean stuff. And I was get. hoping you would call it when I said housewife because I no way do I think that the binaries of femininity and masculinity oh. should be defined that way. To be honest, at times I just ignore you. Oh. <laughs> I didn't even hear you say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was saying it to prompt you to go, Greg. That is not how these things work in this world. Okay. Well, we're going to jump into our What Did We Learn This Week? Okay. <laughs> oh, I have messed up the sound effect. Oh, what did we learn this week? I like those little, you know, um, moments of humility and have, of authenticity in this podcast. How many more mistakes. times can we say that? I feel like every week we're like, oops, I missed the button. Um, if you're new here again, our podcast works this way. We have a little What Did You Learn This Week section. And then after this, we jump into the actual studies and the topics today being Tiger King. So we'll put the time codes in if you just want to jump to that. Uh, Greg, what did you learn this week? So I, uh, this is less about like a brand new knowledge to my brain, more of a reimagining, reawakening of the concept that we as humans are heterotrophs. Yeah, that's not <laughs> heterosexuals. Okay, let me tell you that. <laughs> that's homotrophic. What? No, I'm joking. Wait, what did you say? <laughs> I tried to make a homophobic joke, but oh. it didn't work. <laughs> I'm like, it's actually not homotrophs, it's autotrophs. <laughs> so heterotrophs are animals, organisms that rely on consuming other organisms for energy, which is us. And I feel like I'm just like, it's so obvious to me right now that we're heterotrophs because honestly, the only thing we really have to worry about is leaving our homes to get food and like sustenance to put into our bodies to stay alive. Like it's a really, <laughs> it's, only job. it's crazy to think about that sketch, like talking to ourselves four months ago would be like, we're going to be acutely aware of the fact that like we literally need food to live because we are having a hard time feeling comfortable getting the food. Mm -hmm. So I just think that like, it's so interesting because it's like the main reason that I leave my house is to like, you know, suck it up and go to the grocery store or local store to get this sustenance. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, it's so interesting that an autotroph is an organism that can actually sustain its energy just from the sun and from water and like through like plants. carbon fixation. Yeah. It's like, that is so they make their own food. Yeah. Why can't we make our own food? Well, I mean, I have a <laughs> It's evolution, man. It's, <laughs> uh, it's just not the way that we evolved. <laughs> but uh, but I just mean it's actually like it's just fascinating to me to think about the world that way. Like we get our chemical energy from this food, this thing that we usually just are like, oh, I'm going to go get pizza. Like it's such a part of our like cultural day to day life. But from a biological perspective, it's just so simple. It's like, mm -hmm. OK, we have to we have to actually like eat plants or eat animals who have eaten plants. And those plants are so freaking amazing or whatever that they've been able to carbon fixate or like use photosynthesis to gain energy from the sun. And without that, we truly would die. <laughs> Anyways, this is my other way of just saying thank you to the grocery store clerks and to the frontline workers for supplying us with the carbon that we need to live. Huh. Do you think it's because, is it primarily animals that need to move and stuff, obviously, that, right? Like, are there, I don't know, this is a stupid question. Are there mammals that are autotrophs? I would assume not. Right? right? Like, it's probably just, it's just from the sun, so it would be plants and stuff. Yeah, like I can't think from the top of my head of like. You should look that up. Okay, I'm gonna do that while you tell me what you want. <laughs> no, I didn't mean to. I wasn't no, trying to put you on the I spot. I'm going to do that because I'm actually extremely curious. Yeah. Okay. So what I learned this week is some new interesting research on plastic that came out this week. Um, scientists have created a new mutant 
enzyme that breaks down plastic faster than ever before. So this is encouraging. This is exciting. It's some company, I've forgotten the name, and they were working in partnership with some bigger organizations that, you know, make plastic water bottles. But basically, it's a bacterial enzyme that can break down plastic within 10 hours. Whoa. And this and is what everyone's been wanting. Yeah, I think it's still maybe in this testing phase. They're saying in five years they want to be able to scale it up because they actually get it from fungi. Um, hey. Fungi. 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 Actually, no, um, they actually eat like raw. Okay, anyways, continue. <laughs> oh, wait, and let me just say it. There's, there are no animals that could be considered autotrophic. Okay, good to it's know. It's plants and algae. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so where was I talking about that? Oh, one really unique thing about this enzyme and the way that it breaks down plastic is the other ways they have done it the plastic actually degrades quality and so then it can only be recycled to certain other kinds of things like making carpets or it's basically a lower grade plastic wait making carpets yeah i think like a lot of carpets like polyester and polyester stuff, right? yeah okay so it becomes a lower grade plastic whereas this is able to conserve the plastic quality and so you can recycle it into a high quality plastic new bottle um, basically they found it in a heap of leaves. They like, they, wait, what? Like this, they lifted this like material. A, no, they, they weren't li- just like, mm, here it is. But it's like they, literally a little kid, like lifting up like one of those. Like, no, they were, dead they sticks. screamed like a hundred thousand microorganisms. They screamed? They screamed at them. They just yelled. Yeah. They screamed. What did you think I said? What did you say? I screamed. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> they screamed. Hello, organism. Uh, and then they basically found one was a leaf compost bug, which was first discovered in 2012. And then they realized this bug can also break down the plastic. Uh, they forced it through a series of mutations to optimize its ability to break down the PET plastic. And basically at the end of the day, the cost of doing this is only 4% of that of making plastic from oil. So instead of making more plastic bottles, the incentive for businesses to want to do this is that it's actually cheaper for them to recycle their old plastic. Is there a way to like up to scale this up? Well, I think that was what the article that I read was talking about. This company's goal is to scale this up. Like, you, obviously, you can only produce the enzyme at a certain rate. So they're trying to figure out, okay, how do we now? We have some of these studies. We can show it can do it in this faster time frame than ever before. How do we actually make it viable as a business thing? Or as oh, a, that's so interesting. I'm glad yeah. to be talking about science outside of coronavirus. Yeah, yeah there's hope. And I mean, <laughs> there's so many scientists who are probably a, like, look at this cool thing. And I was a wrong. little skeptical because it, it, I think it was Coca-Cola and some other company that were major investors in this. And so I'm always a little skeptical Red of those flag. companies just because they obviously have a vested interest to make this stuff sort of greenwash to make it sound like it's actually yeah. this amazing thing. But, but I mean, obviously I can understand why these companies are nervous about the future and how people will perceive their products. And if they're using plastic and not having a good form of recyclability that, that will damage their sales long-term, I think. So my hope is that they actually have vested interest in making this work. Not only is it more efficient for them and cost efficient and ideally it helps their PR, you know what I mean? So. Whoa. Okay. Someone's <laughs> under the guise of Coca-Cola over there. Oh my God. Oh, what's so wrong with you? you know, hey, 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 kids, I just got addicted to your sugar. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so weird. Okay. Well, I suppose, or, do you have any comments on that? No, no. I think that's fascinating. I think it's time we get into like, I'm so excited to talk about Tiger King. Me too. I have so many thoughts that I don't, like, I kind of wish. Okay. We're going to hit it. Okay. Study time. Study time. Study time. Study time. Study time. So we will be using studies to dissect Netflix's <laughs> show Tiger King, but we finished it last night. Okay. It took us a while. Okay. I wish we had an excuse, but we've been yep. in quarantine. I did not like it. That is Whoa. my, that is my take. <laughs> I'm done. Podcast done. No, I just want people to know that off the top that like, I was very frustrated by it by the end and I'm excited I, to I, talk about it. I, this might come off as shade, but I actually don't think you're a documentary person. Okay, wow. You might as well call me stupid. You might as well look me in the face and be like, honey, you're down. You're down. No, I think maybe there's a style of documentary you like, but I feel... Okay, actually, actually. Oh, my God. We are... Oh, this is just going to be juicy, juicy con con. That's short. Actually long for content. Um, <laughs> I think it was a really bad documentary. I, I actually think I like documentaries, and I think it was like literally... Poorly executed. And in fact, I heard that uh, quite a few of them were paid. Who was paid? Uh, to be on it. Um, the guy the with no exotic. teeth. 
Oh, but, like the like, and it's like that's actually hunt. like a big issue as a, as as a documentary filmmaker. That's actually a bit a bit of a no no. Why? Because it compromises their truth or something. Yeah, yeah. Like you're not like I mean, this is all like hearsay. A lot of people who have been in the documentary say that they were paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to be in it, whereas a lot of documentary what? filmmakers say that yes, it's it's they have said hundreds it. of thousands. Yes, Finley, the guy with no with no teeth, was uh, paid hundreds. The guy, the guy that came in on the sea do. At the end, oh, that was what weird. was his name? James Garretson. Yeah, they they claim to have been paid a lot by the documentary filmmakers. A hundred, I just hundreds don't... of thousands of dollars is what they claim to be paid individually from the New York Times. This is where it is quoted, but again, Whoa. it's claimed to be play, paid. Yeah, that's sketchy. So let's talk first about our like takes and maybe explain it to the audience for the two people who maybe haven't seen okay. this, and then we'll mix the studies in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, mine mine can come. Mine's better. Okay, I mean, I didn't think it was bad, but I maybe. It was my mic is just like dancing over here. Uh, it was definitely overhyped for me, I think, because we actually started watching it kind of late compared to everyone else. Um, not everyone else, but compared to like when it was blowing up. And then we watched maybe two or three episodes and then we took like three weeks between then. I remember seeing it. on Twitter people being like, gay guys can have tigers too. And I was just like, what is happening? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I and was like, the, I don't like, need jokes to... about Karabaskin, like killing her husband. I was just like, well, this is a spoiler. Oh, also there's going to be spoilers in this. <laughs> yeah. There's going to be spoilers in this. If you haven't watched tiger King, don't in my opinion, uh, but well, uh, I, I had just previously watched McMillions. That's an HBO one about the McDonald's fraud. And I actually enjoyed it. I thought it was a bit too long. And then even more so felt that about this. It feels like they kind of dragged it out longer and it didn't have a very clear narrative. But that was the nature of this story to me, whereas McMillions is like telling a, a specific story. Okay, so what did we think of Joe Exotic? One thing I'll say is he's stylish. He looks like hip, cool kids in Toronto. Like there's this band called 100 Gex that I love who are like <laughs> so cool. And they just have like blonde, like mullet vibes and kind of like dirty. And I was like, do they wear like tasseled? Like, like he, it's interesting how like that like grunge aesthetic that is supposed to be like, kind of I'm back. sure the documentary filmmakers were like, ugh. I was actually like, he actually dresses super <laughs> cool <laughs> so i'll give him that but i really by the end of it was like why is everyone rooting for him he's he's creepy Psychopath. and he's like priming these like little like not little boys but these like young men and it's like yeah. i felt like it was like and now awful. there's a lot of stuff coming out about how racist he is that they had to cut so much stuff out of it because it was so inappropriate and and i don't know if carol baskin killed her husband i'm like yeah. why is everyone talking about that i'm like by that, the, that's the takeaway that was the take like at the end of episode three it's kind of like ooh, juicy juicy but then the last that's three episodes the story, yeah. are very much not about that why are we all still talking about that's that? why i didn't know if maybe the, that conversation was happening as people were watching it so because we kind of took a break the last four episodes we watched didn't really talk about that at all and i was like why is everyone so mean to her? In my I, head, I get misogyny is real. Honestly, I get, that's yeah, what I thought. I get it. that she's kooky. She's an interesting character. She has a very peculiar way of expressing herself. But then I was like, I don't know. I feel like it's probably a good thing that and she's trying to destroy this industry. Yeah, and he literally is just like constantly like everyone's Actually, like free Joe Exotic. I'm like, if you shoot a doll of me in a video, yeah. like I'm gonna call the feds. Like that's yeah. horrifying. And also, if she's such a murderous woman, like you think she would have got him killed? It's like he's the one trying to kill her. I I was so and never once by that. did they have any evidence where they were like he's the one who even. Burn down his own thing, probably. Also, I and I just like a little aside. Doc Antle talks exactly like Jimmy Kimmel. Oh, yeah. it's insane. Like Jimmy <laughs> if you close Kimmel your eyes, or like, is, this is Jimmy. And Kimmel. I'm just like, <laughs> I, it made me not like Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> I was just like Jimmy Kimmel. Like, or is that your brother? Uh, also, it's like, I don't know. I found it really confusing. This whole narrative. People were kind of like, this is an esc Okay, this is a little. We will get into the study. <laughs> After this, or whatever. people were like, this is a great escape. Everyone's thinking this is a great escape from coronavirus and from Trump and blah. blah. I found it to be the opposite. I was like, this is Trump. Yeah, it's like, like the worst part of like, America. Literally, they were talking like they're like, I'm a, as a libertarian, I'm like, fuck the feds. But, you know, I got to listen to them at this point. I don't want to go to jail. Like things like that. I'm like, that is what Donald Trump 
does is he tries to like take government like and the even fact the that way joe exotic tried to become a political president. figure and he was like the way i'm gonna run is i'm gonna take government out of your life like and all that people really care about is controversy and all these things i was like mm-hmm. i can't help but think about donald trump as i watch this and i can't help but think about how scary it is to have someone and, like and joe exotic dealing with a pandemic like yeah to think of people like that were taught the ones that they interviewed that were like i think he'd be great a great leader it goes to show that kind of very I don't want to shit on Americans all the time, but that very American attitude that it's like this idea of not giving a shit about what other people think and just being like a bad ass, whatever. Because yeah. people say that about the Trump. They're like, oh, I know he's like unrefined, but he he tells it to them like it is, blah, blah, blah. It's like, why is that a redeeming quality? Why, like literally you want to be a diplomatic person to be able to listen to all of your constituents. Diplomatic, and, not dictator. Yeah. Yes. So you want to you want to be able to listen to people and come to conclusions that support the majority of people and and but still accommodate the minority of people and those kind of things that I'm just like why is that a trait to be held up high that someone's just an asshole I know I honest I, I mean I thought it was in, it was like interesting the new the fact that he was gay was like interesting yeah yeah like it adds like this other layer of nuance like other than that it would just you know be like this like very like heteronormative like men versus like mm-hmm. that was a really interesting like sprinkle of like curiosity on everything yeah but it was still like it was still about power. Like just cause you're like a gay person doesn't mean you can't have this crazy power over like animals and like other humans and like straight men. <laughs> like they're like, he had like three straight, straight, seemingly straight husbands. It's just like, well, it shows you the last one didn't seem so straight. I mean, and he was gay, so I'm not, no, no, I'm saying it like that, <laughs> but it doesn't really matter. Cause they <laughs> all yeah, at certain all kind of like points said like, we're well, in relationships with yeah. him, but we are in not the last with- one. The last one I thought still loves him. But they all had those moments too, and then in the end, we're like, actually, I'm leaving with this woman. Like, you know what I mean? Like, no, the last one never did that because it's now. Oh yeah, okay. like you know what I mean? Like, there's still an opportunity for yeah, the last I one just to be like. Mean the last one's definitely gay. I think, I think the other two were straight. I think. Wait, you're judging this based on what? Because you shouldn't judge people just based on the way they act, as if they're gay or not. Yeah, but that's really like uh, small what? minded. No, it's not. He's acting gay and then dating a man. <laughs> That's not judging someone True. for being gay. No, but I'm saying like the other, the other ones, two the literally other ones, said the other ones. Okay, the other ones <laughs> dated him, and then also were like we're straight and we're leaving with this woman. Exactly. My point is, they I'm like, said they're straight. Well, I'm into queer, non-binary thinking, and I just do not think that necessarily. Okay, you need to. Get- I think they were queer. I think they were all queer. I think they were all queer. I think an umbrella term is queer, and I think they were all queer. That's fine. I don't need to call them straight, but I'm saying the last guy was gay. <laughs> also, for Canadians, I like the Sean Majumder cameo. <laughs> the guy from like... Oh, yeah, Just for Laughs yeah. or whatever. This hour is um, 22 minutes. Oh, I know him from Just for Laughs. He's a comedian. Okay, well, Canadians, sound off in the comments below. Which one is he from? Well, it's like, I, I understand your comedy scene better than you do. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, tell me a freaking study. <laughs> okay, so this, this study is... Part of the reason how I'm going to explain how this is a horrible, I'm just going to really go there because it's like, you know, okay. as Joe Exotic taught us, controversy is good. Horrible documentary. Okay. <laughs> so I do think that this documentary was completely misguided because I think there are times where they want to be like, this is all about this issue we have with tigers and captive tigers in America. But then we're actually going to turn this into a crazy soap opera to hold people's attention. And the point of view of this whole entire documentary to me was like so off. Like, I don't, I don't know what it was at the end. They just decide for the last 10 minutes to be like, this was actually about the cats the whole time. And it's like, yeah, no, it wasn't. Sorry. You're like trying to fix this mic. Cause you put it. You, sorry. Keep going. <laughs> what did I do? Mitch? <laughs> like the way you put it on the table, if I try to move mine, the whole table like falls over. Okay. Wow. Everything <laughs> is my freaking fault. <laughs> I mean, okay. Okay. No, I'm throwing this. T- I, I flipped the table. <laughs> <I'm> sorry listeners. <sighs> so t- the tiger population suffered an estimate decline of more than 50% in the last 30 years. Hmm. So in the last a hundred years, it's gone down from a hundred thousand wild tigers to now they say it's between 3,000 to 5,000 tigers in the wild, which they actually say at the very end of this documentary, the screen goes black and they explain that to you. And I'm like, you weren't talking about that the whole time. That's not what this was about. Like this wasn't blackfish. You know what I mean? Like it it really frustrated me because I was like, they got to kind of have like the moral high ground or they tried to have the moral high ground at the end as though they were like going to make change. As if this was about at any point in this whole documentary was about us trying to like understand how like 
corrupt and messed mm. up. It, it Like we saw glimpses of it, but it, the point of view was not clear enough. And obviously it, it didn't work because that's not what people are talking about online. They're talking about like how funny it is, which it right. actually was, how entertaining it was, which it actually was. But how like, you know, Joe Exotic like deserves to go to jail. Like Carol Baskin killed her husband. I'm like, then what was the point of this? Because at the end you try and go, it's about tigers. Mm-hmm. So in India, the tiger estimation, like, they have a they have a like essentially like the WWF, but it's like the Wildlife Institute of India. And they say that tiger the wee. Yeah, the we <laughs> that's true. <laughs> or the World War Two. No, actually uh, there's only one W. Never mind. Right. <laughs> the War Two. The War Two. The War Two. <laughs> Tigers now occupy only seven point one percent of their historical range. So it's like it's really, really sad what has actually happened to tigers in the wild versus in captivity. There are now they estimate to be 10,000 captive animals in America, of which only 350 are actually being monitored by like a proper zoo. Hmm. So think about that. So what those people were doing, they're like actually breeding the majority of and, and holding on to the majority of so there's, people there's like t- that. There's double the amount of tigers in America than there are in the wild. So that's just like immediately like, okay, that's really messed up. And what this study was all talking about was how like, X C two like E X dash S I T U like you know how like in science you learn but like in in like X C two means like in a zoo hopefully like in a zoo conservation is important for tigers right now because there are so few of them there's actually only two hundred and fifty tigers in India right now that are like potentially wild and could mate wow like that's that's insane yeah, like yeah, that's, that's so wild. few considering it's also such a quintessential animal like as a child you would learn about it's not like yeah. some it's not like some niche toad that we've never heard of it's like tigers <laughs> and there is that that human like fascination like when you look at them in the show you're like they're big they're beautiful mm-hmm. they're complex they like, are they're so fascinating and and that we also interact with domesticated cats that we kind of have this familiarity with them yeah. you see them act and you go wow they really are like cats so what this study was looking at is that white tigers, like which you see a lot, those are more likely to be inbred. And so they were looking at the DNA of white tigers versus actual wild tiger populations, which are more likely to not be white, which you actually notice in the show, there's a lot of white tigers that end up mm-hmm. like in these little like, yeah. s- like when they pull the freaking like young pups away from their like mm-hmm. mom. It's so sad. And that's actually a sign of inbreeding. But the whole point of this study was being like, it is so important that we have proper conservation techniques and know where all the tigers are and have genetic analysis of every tiger in order to control their population, their genetics in order to like breed them properly if need be. And so the fact that there's 10,000 question mark tigers in America of which only 350 are being properly regulated and studied genetically makes you realize that this show was in my opinion, glorifying this Life. really tragic like messed up thing and spending way not enough time talking about the issue and i think there's a really cool point and thing it could have done which is you know hook people in with the drama and the gossip but then get your point of view across like mm-hmm. be the blackfish for this issue right but they never did that and it frustrated me at the very end when they like showed that. this stat as if i was supposed to at that point care about the tigers yeah. when the whole time i've just been like okay these white people are insane and scary mm-hmm. and like the tigers you have, you sometimes go oh that's so sad but like it's never clear enough how you're supposed to feel and like after Blackfish, I was reading because I think a lot of other people have been sort of there's been a bit of a backlash. I mean, as I think it's I any think popular backlash thing. is happening now. Yeah. But they were like after Blackfish, like SeaWorld stock prices fell and that like it had a huge impact on people wanting to go see that. Whereas a lot of like documentary filmmakers are worried that this is going to like increase yeah, people's fascination with That's, tigers. I was thinking about that. And kind of want and to go get their even photos these taken. Figures, these figures are famous now. Like Joe Exotic, not only he's in jail, whatever, but th- those other people, Doc, whatever, I don't know anyone's name. <laughs> like Carol Baskin. I, know. <laughs> I don't know anyone's name. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm, you're so good at like remembering their names. I'm just like, they're just these No, Doc people. Antle. Doc Antle. Jimmy Kimmel. Jimmy Kimmel. No, not Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> these people are household names now in a way that the show... Yes, the documentary filmmakers would probably debate like they just showed them in their natural way and they didn't want to impose too much of a narrative on them, but they glorified them. And and now we've been told that they took out this entire racist angle of Joe Exotic to not maybe because it was too awful. Like they and they glorified he is likable in some ways in the show, right? But you know deep down he's actually psychotic. 
He wants to kill a person. You find out he is like unethical in so many other ways. Every single person they're working with has is like a felon and has like committed crimes of beating their wives and these weird things that come out that they show you. Yeah, they're not hiding that. But just like you said, it's not ever. I don't know. I don't think the this. Point I don't think view, this has hurt them. I think if anything, yeah. if Joe Exotic gets out of prison, or even if he's in prison, he is going to be happy with this because he is more it. famous now than he ever. And there ever were really funny. Like I, I feel like I'm like, oh, Greg, you're always such a freaking critical downer. Like I'm like I'm like I do feel frustrated about that being what I like jump to all the time. But I'm like at the end, I was like these documentary filmmakers for sure panicked. Like they definitely were like, okay, we have not a clear point of view, which I'm like, I'm pretty sure is what everyone says is the number one thing when you're making a movie or anything is what's your point of view. It's like, then they just at the end were kind of like, and you know, these people who work there, they were caged animals too. And it's like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> wait, so are we talking about the animals? Like, I guess what are you here's trying what to say? I would in their defense. I think there's a couple different kinds of documentaries and one that you go in with the clear point of view. But to me, what was interesting about this is it was clear that they, they were with them for a long time and they, it spanned like they were there when Joe exotic went to jail. So their narrative was never defined. I think they were like, let's start filming this. I don't know how long mm-hmm. it took course over. It might've been years, which is cool. But sometimes, flip like yeah that. and sometimes documentaries something happens but maybe they were like you know what this is what has happened there's lots of stuff that's like happened. screw this conservation we're, of tigers this is well, juicy i don't think they went in for the conservation of tigers i think they went in to be like this entire world is crazy let's document it for a few years and then they captured then, this story yeah, and the, and maybe if it went a different way they might have been able to latch on to more of a conservation angle or something but it just became about how intense this interpersonal relationship between these couple characters was and obviously is compelling because they're all such characters like even carol baskin is such a fascinating i know and they're and they're in the first two episodes which i really enjoyed i'm like this is freaking hilarious like yeah it's (laughs) funny because they're actually so absurd but then it felt like the last three episodes were very serious and that's when i started to because it becomes like a drama like it becomes like a murder mystery or almost like a thriller because they're trying to do this thing and kill her and you're watching it happen. And the whole time you're watching these tigers that are like, you know, captive and not properly studied, getting killed, getting mm-hmm. who knows, like actually yeah, being just killed. looking at it and seeing them always pace back and forth in their cages. You're like, this is so messed up. And it's interesting. It's fascinating to learn about that it's important to think about that the way that we treat animals is a really important thing to talk about it's like at any opportunity we should be thinking about that like pets like everything it's like it's a fascinating like biological concept there's so much like rich information there that i'm just surprised that by the end it never went there and then it ended up just being about like joe exotic's court case and then it ended up with everyone like championing so exotic online kind of <laughs> and that carol bassett killed her husband i was like this is like it's this weird thing. takeaways like we're all like kind of like ending up like crazy and absurd. yeah i will say it i'm on carol baskin's side Me maybe too. it's like did i forget the first half of the show i don't remember and but also, also like, they, she's trying to pass a law to like yeah. help and i'm like i don't understand and why I, we don't the, like the way they construe her story like the the characters in the show they act as though she's doing this because she wants to be the only one who can have the profit and control the animals and keep them all for herself but if you actually think a little deeper you realize she's trying to pass these laws and shut down breeding programs which would ultimately in the end put her out of business in the long run and for in the those- long run she wouldn't be able to bring in tigers anymore so if this is all for her why is she still trying to destroy the end ind- like i i just don't buy this idea that she is just doing it because she's greedy and she wants to be the only tiger breeder. Like she doesn't breed tigers. I thought I know. And for everyone who is just listening to the podcast, we are wearing Carol Baskin's Hey You Cats and Kittens t-shirts right now. And we do volunteer our (laughs) time for free at her place. And we think that she's a really good influencer. (laughs) No, like I definitely think that she like, created like a bit of a cult and like that like when they did their whole i need to go on facebook and watch her videos i realized like whenever she was recording them i'm like wait how many people are watching these and she does what we do which is like she didn't really get that set up or like put on makeup or do anything she kind of just like flicked her hair a bit and then pressed record cats and kittens (laughs) yeah and i was like i I I really do relate to that like whenever i press record and like see that our videos get seen by millions of people i'm like greg maybe you should like learn to put on makeup or something like (laughs) Uh, okay let's take a little break when we come back after a comment corner i am going to talk about the ancient history of cats and their domestication. 
Comment Corner. Oh, that's a beautiful song. Oh, okay. <laughs> so today we have a comment from Valley Animale. Like that name. Um, and they had to say, I'm a research scientist who has been missing living and breathing science recently as my lab is closed and I'm at home with my lovely but very much non-scientific family. This made me feel like I was <laughs> hanging out with my lab mates. I learned so much from it. I love it. Thank you for doing this. I love that. Drag Thank your family. You, yeah. <laughs> I like to see the fit. Like, you know what? I'm sick of this. You guys None are you. not scientific. <laughs> yeah. Throwing the plate against no the wall. No one will read nature with me or talk about science. <laughs> no one magazine. even knows what DNA polymerase is. <laughs> um, that's nice. I hope everyone feels that way. We love to hear what you guys. I totally can relate us. to that though. Like when you're like with friends and you're like, I always try and bring up science, and, and people like, are just oh, like, yeah. that's literally boring, or like I literally <laughs> don't like want. Like it's just like sometimes that like can be really frustrating. Yeah. Like, like it's hard. Are you shading your friends? No, 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 no. I'm just saying like, it's a funny thing that I haven't really ever articulated, but to hear articulated like with my non-scientific family. Yeah. It's weird. I've, uh, I've never actually also, like I listen to a lot of podcasts, but I don't watch a lot of you. Like no, a lot of the podcasts I listen to do not have video versions and I wish they did because I think that'd be fun. I'm going to like, you know what I mean? There's only a handful of video podcasts I can think about that are, I don't listen to those. It's because anyway. we're so like YouTube in our brain because it's like we did YouTube yeah, as but I got. hope this is fun for everyone listening not only but also watching on YouTube and I hope this is a fun little hangout and I yeah I appreciate yeah, you guys watching. watching on YouTube oh my god Greg taking his Carol Baskin journal my nipples <laughs> out my nipples out that's uh, only for the people on YouTube okay let's keep going <laughs> alright oh wrong song. oh my god Wait, what was that, that? Okay, for I'm, any ecologist out there who can tell us what bird that is, 10,000 points in the game <laughs> that I just made up. I was going to try and hit this button, which is that fancy sound we got. Oh, wow. Okay. This time I turned into a duck. Quack, quack. <laughs> okay. So I know you said everyone had their like ancient Egyptian time. When, like you actually went through Okay, that. I feel like it's grade seven curriculum. I'm going to say in Ontario. You learn about mummification, you know, like they pulled their brains out with those hooks. Also for us, born at, in 1988, we actually happened right as this curriculum was being taught to us. Boom, the mummy drops with Brendan Fraser. So it's just like this. Which in was mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. Scarab beetles, <laughs> genius. Like yeah. going into your skin. Like yes, the, terrifying. Just sort of like the fact that the action Hollywood movie came out right as your teacher was teaching you about this thing. It was like, wait, what is school? What is entertainment? <laughs> what a perfect time. Perfect storm of to, science communication. To fall in love with the concept or of history. ancient <laughs> Egypt. And I do think that it might just be a literal born in 1988 zeit no. cultural zeitgeist. Uh, or does everyone, <laughs> regardless of age, you know, really feel like there's a time where they fell in love with Egypt? Well, I have to tell you, I that I certainly was in, you know, taken in at that time in my life. But I just think everyone loves Egypt because it has, you know, one of the oldest recorded histories that we really understand in terms of an advanced civilization, which has monuments that still exist today. That even today we have a hard time exactly understanding why or how or how long and like it took Cleopatra to build. Cleopatra was like the first makeup influencer. Like yeah. literally did cat totally. eye with like charcoal <laughs> and stuff, and it's like we're yeah, like still doing bug that. blood, leaf and plant smushed, and like I don't know, like. What else did they dust on their face? Other kinds of deals oh and stuff. God. I was just trying to think of like other ways they made makeup. But <laughs> they're just such a fascinating uh, culture in terms of what we hear and how we're like, how could something 4,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago be so advanced and build these things? And that's why there's so many theories around like aliens and stuff that came to help the Egyptians build the I pyramids. love that one. It's like, oh, shut. Like a white person definitely said that. Like, it had to be aliens because we're the smartest. <laughs> Um, okay, so I wanted to specifically another thing that affected me was a handful of video games. Like Age of Mythology was a video game I used oh, to Oh, I was to actually play. really, I was actually better than you at that. Yeah. Okay, we're not going to go there. Um, and so basically it was like a war game, but you got to pick, you could be oh, Egyptian. You picked Egyptian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was but you would pick the different gods, the gods or goddesses yeah. that you I, would represent in your culture, or you could be like Nordic, or you yeah. could be Roman, or you could be. I, I'd be no, I would I would be Nor Nordic <laughs> usually, and I would. Win could you every name time. one of the Nordic gods? Yeah. They, Vi you should be able to. Yeah, the Goflafrensler. No, there's literally a movie named after one. Oh, Thor. Yeah. <laughs> and his brother is? 
Um, uh, Chris Hemsworth. Loki. Liam Hemsworth. Yeah, and his dad's name is uh, Sean Hemsworth. Odin, isn't it? <laughs> um, getting into this, uh, what I loved about it, it was some of those gods. You would have cats for f- faces, for heads. <laughs> what am I saying? Like they would like a lot of e- Egyptian artwork would feature dogs as their gods or cats as their gods. So I think that's what kind of like when Carol Baskin would wear. Uh, Carol Baskin uh, is the woman that we love. Uh, would wear those uh, cat hats that almost made it yes, look yes, exactly the like same she thing was a cat. as the way the Egyptians would worship their gods and goddesses. Yeah. Um, anyway, let's get actually into this. So DNA suggests that cats domesticated themselves, whereas dogs were domesticated by humans. At first, I was like, "What does this mean?" But I have a piece of trivia for you, Greg. Okay, bring Have it you on. heard of a saber tooth tiger? Tiger, yes. And they actually existed and they <laughs> lived. It, wait, what's the question? I'm just about to go off. Yeah, them. give me your, every piece of fact you know about them. Did you know they're not tigers? Oh, they're not as they're not from the scientific name of the Tigris? No, so their names have been changed to saber toothed cat. But do you want to know something else? Wait, so they're actually not called saber tooth tigers. They're called saber tooth cats. Yeah, it's not. A, it's not their name anymore. True. Fair. Okay. What else? Uh, what else? They're actually not cats. Okay. So, well, you're just taking me on a on a whoopty loopty <laughs> whoopy swivel swivel. Yeah, Where I, are I we? only brought this up because a recent study found that saber tooth cats aren't cats. Uh, well, no, they found that they're they were interacting with humans around well early hominins around three hundred thousand years ago. They have found their fossils mixed with human fossils and spears. So it's just interesting to know that humans have been dealing with large cat-like animals for a long time. I just wanted to throw that little fact Wait, out you just there. said they're not cats. I don't know what to call them. They're just like another they're kind They're just different of species. Yeah, okay, that okay, looks okay, similar okay. to cats. Yeah, they really But do. they're not <laughs> considered like the same lineage. They're um, so freaking cool. I love that, like, learning about the, the animals around that time where there was, like, all these, like, giant animals mm-hmm. that we were, like, that humans were, like, existing with. Yeah. More movies on that, Hollywood. Come on. Yeah, when you true. start getting up and no, running again, that's you know when, you're that's when Hollywood's like, well, we got to make them talk. And you're like, oh, okay, now we have, like, a talking saber-toothed tiger movie. Unless it's Drag unless it's Ice Pixar. Age. No, I'm saying those are the only versions, but how else would they make a movie? Okay. When I was a science <laughs> teacher and the semester would be ending and it would be, like, the last week, I'd be like, we're going to watch Ice Age because it's science and we would like <laughs> like they'd be like ice age again i'd be like yeah because it's in the realm of science it's like so inaccurate anyways okay so now this newer research has basically found that the domesticated cats come from two different lineages of sort of prehistoric cats they basically looked at romanian mummies of cats and egyptian mummified cats. you mean like roman now that i wrote romanian i am like yeah that must have meant like ancient Rome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I t- I'm like, I need to go to this article and read if I just wrote I'm that. I'm sure it's ancient Rome, but that's I really just, interesting like, typing to these think notes about, like, and, like, Romania? Like, wait, I want to actually quickly look that up. Yeah, it says Romanian, ancient Romanian cat remains. So I'm assuming that's Rome. Um, moving on, as well as African wildlife specimens. So basically, the first lineage of cats mixed with humans around eight thousand years ago wait what do you mean mixed with humans? so what they think is because humans started performing agriculture and that would have attracted mice and rats to come and eat oh that food my God. um like wild cat species would have stumped, started to hang around humans because that's where all of their feed was oh. and so that's why for thousands of years cats existed this way and unlike dogs which were bred for specific traits cats were more just around humans because <laughs> they because they were there was like <laughs> almost a symbiotic relationship and then that's hum- still kind of what it is it's like yeah, cats are just like just around, around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh and so then the humans actually ended up starting to take cats with them on voyages whether it was across land or whether across sea because uh, even on like boats and stuff they would help deal with rats and mice oh my god um, but the interesting thing is that looking at all those mummified cats and African wildlife specimens, they realize that the DNA of cats from today is almost identical. So <gasps> they have not been bred in the same way of dogs. They're basically not the exact same necessarily, but they're, more, but they're so similar to their ancient relatives. They're, they're legit. They're not. 
authentic. Which is why I guess they can survive on their own and like go hunt. And yeah, because I thought the definition of domesticated meant that they couldn't survive without humans. And I've heard the argument when I was... That cats can. That cats aren't necessarily domesticated because if we did all die, like, like they, they would, probably... would probably figure it out. Whereas like our dog Ernie would truly die. Like <laughs> yeah. hit by a car in a second. Like I'm like, yeah. it's interesting. Like cats are like... You know, they are definitely more independent and able to survive yeah. on their own, like less. <laughs> and they can hunt cats. I yeah. saw something else come out recently that was like they started tracking cats. I don't know what city it was in. And they realized they're responsible for like one third of all wildlife death, like of birds or something. Wow. I need to I need to fact check that. I'm sorry, but I just saw that the other day. Um, I mean, <laughs> sorry, you know when you like saw something and then you're like, I probably shouldn't say that. Yeah, we argue about this all podcast. the time. I'm like, was that a Reddit headline, Mitch? <laughs> yeah. Reddit facts. It was, but it was in our science, so I trust them. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> um, so where am I going with this? Oh, the second lineage came from ancient Egypt around 1500 BC. And I thought it was interesting because huh. it was for the same reason. Ancient Egyptians often worshipped cats because they would kill rats and scorpions and snakes. And so they were considered like protectors. Um, there was a couple gods and goddesses that were look like cats. The earliest was called Mafdet. He's typically seen as a leopard or a cheetah. And then Bastet. Uh, yeah, ha, wait, Bastet. <laughs> Bastet is a domesticated cat. It was originally, I think, through the years it started. Carol Bastet? Carol Bastet. No, imagine how her name. Carol Bastet. Um, yeah, I think that's mostly... Oh, so then they are domesticated in the sense that the only difference between modern-day cats and old ones is the tabby cat pattern. So tabby cats have this sort of splotch cats and or tabby stri- cats. <laughs> they never do they say tabby cats ever in cats? Tabby. Tabby 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 <laughs> tabby 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 um, tabby tabby. So those markings are the new, unique thing about domesticated cats Wait, and that happens. What is over, a tabby marking? It's like the different colors of like splotch little yellow and brown and like oh, I thought cat. tabby kind of meant like a little bit like like a little rough around the edge. No, I think it has to do with their actual coat of fur and oh, co- the coloring. I'm thinking tattered cat. Yeah, that's a tatter, tattered. Okay, well. Uh, and yeah, that would that only came about I think in the 1800s when they started to realize it was a very distinct trait because over time they would have obviously much like dogs they would have started breeding. preferred not necessarily breeding like the cats probably would have just bred on their own but they would have preferred and cats would have mixed with humans who were calmer, kinder, weren't as violent to humans. So there would have been some selective breeding, but maybe not as intentional. Whereas dogs literally were bred yeah. to hunt these things or to swim. And they definitely to... have bred cats based on the way they look to probably, you know what? I feel so dumb because I actually don't, maybe because I've never really loved cats and I love dogs and it's so clear <gasps> to me, dog breeds, but not very clear to me. You just breeds. lost us so many freaking followers. No, I'm just, you know what? I'm speaking my truth. Okay. <laughs> So if you like cats, that's fine because also in this article, they said that cats were perfect as they were and they never needed to evolve or be bred because they did a perfect job for humans in terms of whereas dogs had to be bred. So I'm like bashing dogs a little bit like dogs had to be trained and then selectively bred to take on tasks whereas cats came as they were. And that was perfect. So cat people, I'm supporting you still. I just like I'm allergic. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's the legit reason. Um, but that's my cat facts, and I just love ancient cat history. That's pretty amazing. I did not, like, I guess I've, I obviously have thought about cats in my life. <laughs> I've never thought about cats. But I never had a cat. I've never owned a cat. And um, it is like, yeah, I just. Would I you guess, ever own a cat? I mean, I think so but like i never really i didn't I, I would not have owned a dog if it weren't for you so i'm not gonna oh. get a cat unless you're all of a sudden become a cat person no i'm allergic i can't so then i guess maybe not i think cats are really cute especially when they're like dogs okay, yeah, whoa, whoa. <laughs> uh, okay i have one other fact that if we have time for i wanted to bring up just from the show we make the rules but true oh our producer is nodding kidding There's oh gotta producer. wrap up um so I looked up the Walmart meat donation. Ew. Program. Oh my God. Because okay, this is wait, a big wait, part wait, of the wait, show. Wait, wait. We need to explain this. <laughs> In the Back show, the barf. Joe Exotic gets their animal meat that they feed the animals from this Walmart meat program. And they feed the customers at one point. They oh, allude yeah. to the fact that the, but the pizza. pizza. He's like, come on down to Joe Exotic <laughs> where you can eat a pizza next to a wild animal. And then it just shows. I'm like, is that is that something that we want? Is that something that <laughs> we want? I didn't know that, that was something that we want. And he's like, the best pizza in town. And pizza. then they allude. They do a lot of alluding in this poorly filmed documentary. Well, about, also the staff eat that meat. 
Yeah, no, I know that's not fair. I shouldn't. Which, which, okay, so I'm gonna talk about it a bit because okay, I shouldn't yeah, laugh at it so much. I think it's like obviously intense that if they're feeding that to people unknowingly. But I looked into it, and I'm not one to ever tout Walmart. And these are all talking points. You know, I'm talking about Coca Cola today. I'm supporting Walmart. <laughs> Basically, this program is a capitalist pig. Oh my god, he's growing a pig nose. <laughs> In Canada, at least, I looked this up. Walmart Canada has committed to zero food waste by 2025, which is really soon. And I was like, that's pretty cool. And so this is part of that program. So in one way, they've committed to optimizing the way they order food Hmm. and have food displayed and how it gets, like they make sure that their numbers are perfect so that they don't have that much food waste. And then they have these food donation programs that basically unpurchased food that's near expiry or can go to captive tigers. (laughs) Yeah, no, I guess they have different (laughs) charitable groups or organizations. It says Walmart works to maximize its use and get food that is still edible to people in places that need it most. I mean, that is, that is obviously okay, a good Walmart. Thing. That should always have been, yeah. We don't necessarily need to clap because it's like they should have always Who been doing that. was just clapping. That was really weird. <laughs> but they have donated uh, 3.3 billion pounds of food since 2005. So cool. So that is where this food is coming from. And I didn't want to laugh at the fact that obviously the people there were eating it because they obviously all talk about no, not that's having a lot not, of money. No, the issue was, was the, 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 yeah, the part pizza. was the like you were eating pizza and I just think people who bought the pizza assume it's not. Yeah. And even, that, it, even the employees kind of make it seem like it's sketchy. They're like, well, they ate it to save money, but well, they also do a lot of things like even well, wrap this up but maybe we can end with the like final episode that they released recently was i thought was so frustrating but they were talking about how like some of them were like we were sober when they alluded to the fact that we were on meth like oh you're right like but that was a little is that bit, what that guy was saying you remember when they were like meth teeth and they cut to the guy with not very many teeth oh yeah like yeah. in order for you as an audience member it's alluding to the fact that he's probably on drugs but he was like i was sober for five years at that point like there's a lot of times in the documentary where i'm like i could see that they're alluding to things very cleverly with cuts mm. and stuff that's like that isn't necessarily right, like implying fair. something and they're like well we didn't say it but then and it is like, just there like this is just their word against the documentary yeah. filmmakers but some of those cuts like even that like walmart meat thing they cut back to this gross image of all the meat like being falling out, out of a, a truck, truck with like blood and mm-hmm. water and then cut to the pizza and him eating the pizza. And you're like, okay, obviously you're trying to right. create, that's like filmmaking, create an emotional reaction, but you're right. Like if you stop and I'm pretty and think sure about one it, of the people was like, and I'm pretty sure they might've put that in the pizza, but they never are yeah. like, it was in the pizza. And there's like another world where like every like hippie dippy, like, us would be like we actually really want to support this new pizza place because all the meat actually comes from a no (laughs) waste environment like it is all about like the way that you spin things and sometimes i really felt like that it was but joel McHale, who's like hosted this reunion of the that was so weird was so bad like when they email email when they talk to jeff lowe who grosses me out which one's that the one who took over oh the time, yeah who has who like, is like who, incest yeah, with like, his like babysitter and or like whatever. yeah and like had like obvious like literally proven dom- domestic violence mm-hmm. really like showing like kind of like a really gross treatment of women he just kind of bros out with him and laughs with him i'm like this guy's yeah. like a convict like this guy is like yeah you, if, why are you just like laughing law- so silly when like literally the documentary ends by going like he's the fbi is investigating him and he's gonna get what's coming and it's like, like this it's almost like he's the bigger mastermind. Exactly. And it was like, you're literally like broing out and like LOLing. And it frustrated me because I was like, okay, this m- documentary ends where I'm like, what was your point of view? This could mm-hmm. be really problematic. Why was this? Why are you at the last minute being like, it's about tigers? It's like, no, 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 it's not about tigers. Especially, then, yeah, this like reunion bachelorette style. Exactly. Like, and then it was like, it was like, rah, it I don't was know like, why re- I said bachelorette or bachelor. I just meant either one. You know? No, yeah, I know. I've, I've never watched that shows, but like, yeah, I'll strike them. But like, then it's just like, it like the, the editing and everything. And then Joel McHale just like laughing with them and being like, oh, you're famous now. Bizarre. What does it feel like? Yeah. I was like, this is bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it really, A, I wonder if the director had a say in that because it actually, to me, took away from the documentary because it did exactly that. It was like, this further proves that this is just glorifying the fact that they've become famous from the documentary and is not actually giving me any follow up. Like, I thought maybe it would touch more on, oh, this documentary was made in, you know, a year ago, and now we're, we're wanting to update people a little bit on yeah, where things are Yeah, or don't have Joel McHale get, like, Barbara Walters, or, like, yeah, someone who's like actually inv- going to, like, like, question them. Yeah, yeah, he was just like, hey, and his, his like, weird. even his, like, tone is so, like, hey, what's up? Like, pfft. Well, welcome to this. Like, you're all celebrities. I'm not even a celebrity so anymore. I was like, this and is And maybe weird. the fact that it was 
like in quarantine didn't help. But I think if that was done in a studio, I might even feel more weird. Because they would have definitely had like tiger print like backdrops and they would have, it would have looked like the Survivor reunion and yeah, it would have been so I know. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, wait. Uh, I had one other thing I wanted to bring up about Carol Baskin. The, the woman we love. The, why do we, like, I don't know. I'm like, we're gay I'm like, did men. we miss we're drawn, something? Yeah, no, we're drawn towards women. And but I'm people just, would think that we're drawn towards the gay man. No, because he wanted to kill someone. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I did not understand. Ew. Okay. I'm in support of Carol Baskin. Is that is that okay? To say? I don't know. I'm like, I'm so confused. I'm like, is everyone are we actually gonna get canceled? Like, yeah, like, are we, we actually we gonna get canceled? We missed an episode and they're like, no, she literally killed her husband. It's proven. And I was like, her, sp- her it looked like the cages were bigger. Okay. And it honestly <laughs> did. I was like, it looks like an expansive backyard. No offense. Not that I know anything about. Obviously, mm. none of them should be in cages, but actually, no, you need proper. Yeah, psychology. she came out and said she felt massively betrayed by the documentary film like her. You know what? I'm going to call, I'm going to go volunteer. I'm kidding. Ugh, okay. <laughs> um, gosh, I'm so annoyed that I had something else I wanted to bring up, but I've just forgotten. Uh, at the end of the day, your rating out of 10 for this documentary. Okay. Five. Five. Okay. So like, It was very entertaining at the beginning. I was having a lot of LOLs. I did not know where it was going. But then by the end of it, I was like, I could have done without that. I or would, I would also comment on the fact that, yeah, I feel like you've never, you've never been into more recent genre of documentary film, like Making a Murderer, like... Um, more like Making Me Go to Sleeperer. That was a snooze You fest. didn't watch it. How many episodes did you watch? I, I tried, but I kept being like, aren't okay, your see, eyelids heavy? All I'm saying is you're not into this. You didn't watch Wick Millions with me. You started watching, what's the one with Bagwan called? Like the, the religious cult one. Oh, I liked that one. But you didn't finish it. Like, I loved <laughs> that and was obsessed with it. So I think this genre of documentary, which has, is kind of like the new era of documentary in this kind of entertainment world, like of Netflix's and HBO's. It's like reality TV makes documentary meets. Yeah. Yeah. Or it just has a very specific style and it's very formatted and like formulaic. Uh, I would give it, I think I'd give it a seven. I think... It, maybe because it was overhyped. Maybe if I had come across it before I knew it was so groundbreaking and so popular, I might've been like, whoa, this is insane that I just came across this, which had happened to me with that other one. I knew my friends had said it was good. I don't know uh, why I can't think of the name. What one? The one with the religious cult. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I can't remember No I nation or something? Rat. No country? I don't know. Um... And I would have given that a nine or 10. I loved that one. I found it so fascinating. So this one to me wasn't quite as fascinating, but I still liked it. Still very entertaining, but I agree. It didn't really have a point of view or any, like, I was kind of like, these are all just mostly bad and people. And potentially led to like an like, increase it, it, in like yeah. the tiger issue in America. Uh, anyway. Okay. Well, thank you guys for We are closing the Tiger listening. King book right now. It is literally like Harry Potter. One, two, three. Closed. It was interesting while it lasted. I'm glad we watched it. I had fun. Oh, one last point about it. It was just too long. Like, I think they could have put it into five episodes instead of seven. Speaking of long, this might have been too long. We are going to go. We'll see you. <laughs> okay. See you guys next, next time. Hashtag sign out podcast. <laughs>